Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Talk. I'm Brenda Stroth, your host, and I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you for listening in. For those of you on podcast, appreciate you listening in. And for those of you that are here or watching on replay, blessings. I'm so glad to see you all. It's really nice to have you. We have an incredibly special guest today. Um, we have Dr. Halisa Aylwine. And I'm thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. It's a pleasure, really. Dr. Lisa. Yeah, I, these, out, I can see somebody's on here from Galveston, Texas, which is my husband's hometown. Um, yes, Debbie. Her, mm -hmm. His mother is. She's uh, at the Meridian there in Galveston. Um, just been diagnosed with COVID again. So um, oh. these, these nursing homes are really tough because it's, it's so hard to get in to see your loved ones and you worry about what's going on with them. Right. Wow. Yes. Twice. Wow. Wow. So we got the test, I think. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to actually just like read a little bio. Uh, it's a very shortened bio. Can I just say that you have done a lot in your young life? <laughs> <laughs> and so let me put my glasses on so I make sure I'm reading the right one. <laughs> uh, Dr. Halisa Elwine teaches a framework of the Bible called the creation gospel. And I think that most of our listeners are very familiar, but there's going to be some people that are new that will have not heard of that. And <laughs> whoops, <laughs> did you? I got mute. It's all right. It's all right, sister. <laughs> Thank you, Pietra. You are so good at your job. Can I just say gold star? <laughs> um, okay, so she does a framework of the Bible called the creation gospel, the key concepts and symbols of which are found Genesis to Revelation. And I just love that. Through these symbols, Dr. Elwine teaches and elaborates upon the concepts and themes found in the Torah, the first five books of Moses, the Psalms, the writings of the Jewish prophets, and the New Testament. Dr. Elwine has her BS and, and her master's from Texas A&M and a doctorate from Oxford Graduate School. And that's not all, but we won't. We, won't, we need to have a little bit of time to get, <laughs> to get you speaking, so we won't get into all the others. But um, she's the author of Standing with Israel, and the Creation Gospel Workbook Series, uh, along with all the Becky books. And um, those are amazing. She's a student and teacher of the word and specializes in adult curriculum and instruction, especially in the correctional setting. Uh, you can purchase her works through Amazon. And I put that up on the link so you all can just go in there and um, have at it. Enjoy. She has amazing, amazing material. So again, Dr. Elwine, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to just kind of, if you don't mind, I just want to kind of sit back and enjoy. I just would love for the ladies to get to know you. And um, if you don't mind, can I just ask you some questions and we'll just kind of start there? Sure. Okay, good. That's good. Um, when did you first discover Yeshua as your Messiah? When did, when did that happen and what was, what was that experience? How did that change your life? Um, I think we were probably living in Los Angeles. I was around five or six, probably six. And um, I was going to Sunday school. And at some point it was, it was such a small church that um, th they didn't really have separate classes for the kids. Like we were all herded into one room. So it was, you know, my age all the way up to teenagers. And uh, so I got, we kind of all got the same lesson, which was like the one room schoolhouse. If you're younger, you catch on faster. And if you're older, you, you kind of get responsible for the younger kids. And I heard the, the message of salvation there and listening to the teacher read the scriptures to us, even in the King James. <laughs> wow. You know, I just, I love the words. It was just connection. It was like home. That's the only way I can describe it because I've never felt at home anywhere else but the scriptures. And so that's why when you go to Israel, all of a sudden, you know, you're home. 
you're mm. you're in the true home and so uh they had this contest like if you memorize so many scriptures uh you would win a prize and it was anything from like a bookmark all the way up to this wonderful book of pictures of Israel. And I wanted that book. For some reason, I was fixated on that book. And I was delayed in learning how to read. I didn't learn how to read until the end of first grade. And so I desperately wanted that book, but I knew I would have to memorize a lot of Bible verses to get that book. And so I told my teacher and she says, well, honey, maybe you'd be happier, you know, with the bookmark because that's a lot of scriptures to memorize. And I said, I can't read. <laughs> Why do I need a bookmark? Uh, <laughs> there's no point in that. I want the book. It's got pictures in it. I don't need to read to see the pictures in the book. And so my mom helped me. She would say the verses aloud. And then I would repeat them until I memorized them. And as, as it turned out, I did memorize enough scriptures to earn the book that had the pictures of Israel, because every time we would read the scriptures, it was about Israel. You know, the, the stories, they're all set in a particular place. They're in Israel. Let, let me find out. Let me see this place they're talking about. And I think that was part of the experience and being able to connect Yeshua to a place and to a people, and then somehow connecting myself to that plan. And I think the, the formal profession of faith was probably in vacation Bible school in somebody's garage uh, in Whittier, in California. <laughs> I was too young, I don't know. Um, but I just remember like, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. I'm like, okay, I'm cool with that. Can I get the book now? So uh, <laughs> there was there was a lot going on at that little window of my life. Mm, how beautiful! And you know, it's really interesting is that that love that you had as a young child. It is the same love whenever you talk about the land, whenever you talk about getting back to the land and how important that is to you. It's that same. You can see that same bubbling forth. So how, how do you feel about the land of Israel right now? Um, it's, it's pretty much my obsession. It, and it goes again back to the book. You know how I was obsessed with the book and then the salvation was all wrapped up in that because I, I really could see, you know, what Brad Scott always said. It's about a land, a covenant, and a people. And you have to fit in there. It's, it's not going to wrap itself around you. You have to attach to that. And um, so Israel, I think the first time we went was in 2000. And then I started going back for language school and tours and other things. But it's the only place, you know, I, I, we've lived up until we moved here. I mean, we would move every two to three years when I was a kid growing up. So there was no real connection to a place called home. And I think that's why the Bible became home. And so now, if I'm not in Israel, that's where my soul is. That's where my longing is. And if I want to reconnect with my soul, I have to go back. Mm. And uh, one of my favorite places other than Jerusalem is down in the south at a place called Tamar. And it's uh, the Tzin wilderness where Miriam died. And I just have oh. some sort of connection to that particular location. There's a spring that's, it's a long hike out through the desert and it's hot, but once you find it, it's like an oasis and there's palm trees and there's this spring that creates these streams that, that run year round, no matter what time of year. And it doesn't depend on rainfall. It's just there ever flowing. And we, you know, we can stick our feet in the water there and look around and we're like, you know, every morning there was manna here. And so I have a particular connection to that place. I don't know what it is, but anywhere in Israel is good with me. 
do you recommend that people that that people need to get to Israel? I mean, do you recommend that to people that they need to physically get there and experience the land? If they can only do it once in their lifetime, yeah, at least once, because things happen, inexplicable things happen when you go, and you may not even expect them to mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you know instantly what just happened, and sometimes you only understand in hindsight what happened, but there is always a meeting. Yes. And it's, it's usually very personal. Sometimes it can happen with a group of people, but typically it's, it's a mess. It's a personal message to you. It's just like a kiss on the mouth, like welcome home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without physically appearing before you, it's like Yeshua says, so good to see you. This is my favorite place. You know, I wrote about my favorite place from Genesis to Revelation. And if you love this place as much as I do, then you'll come and experience what I experienced and what we will experience. You know, in the kingdom, the word's going to go forth from Jerusalem. Everything's restored. And it, it is a special place and special things happen there. And I, you know, things I can't explain have happened there. And you have an example? You want to give us an example? Um, I went to Hebron with, mm -hmm. I took a family from our congregation who could only go in the summertime because school teachers. And um, I agreed to go with them under one condition, could we go to Hebron? Because I'd always wanted to go to Hebron, but it's a higher security location and you can't always get in there. But somehow in all the comings and goings, I had never been able to go to Hebron. And I knew there was something special about the place because it's mentioned all through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Right. Uh, and you don't even get the name of Jerusalem, the complete name, you only get part of the name of Jerusalem. And they said, okay. And so we were able to get in that morning and we had a, a guide that took us. He had a, a bulletproof, he had bulletproof windows on his car. And uh, you, you need kind of that Israeli presence with you in a location like that to kind of get past the security. And uh, so we got in and we went inside and I walked around and I looked, you know, at the you're not looking at the tombs themselves. You're in a building on top of the caves. And so there will be a representative place there, like for the tomb of Abraham, uh, Sarah. We can't get on the Isaac and Rebecca side right now. It's controlled by Muslims. But Jacob and Leah are also on this side. So I walked around. I'm like, well, whatever it was I was supposed to experience here, I don't think it's here. I mean, it's just it's a graveyard for sure. Um, but lots of people praying, they'll go there to pray. And I knew that according to the tradition, Jewish tradition, this was an entryway back to the garden of Eden. And supposedly Adam and Eve are also buried there. And the idea of being, let us be buried here, first out, first in, you know, uh, and this is why it was so important to Abraham to purchase that land, not just for himself, but for his wife and his son and his uh, grandchildren, because it was a sign of faith in the resurrection. Like this is the entryway and at the resurrection, our bodies will be right here. And that's the message we, we miss when we read the things about Hebron and Abraham. Yes. And Isaac and Jacob. We don't read that subtext that a Jew would read that goes along with it, that the very fact that they're buried at Hebron says they believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believe in the message of Yeshua, even way back then. And so uh, I thought, well, whatever it is here, I don't know. So I went outside and there's a landing and then there's steps that take you back down to the courtyard. And as I came out the door, uh, I saw an Israeli soldier with his back to me and he's just leaned over. There's a, a concrete wall there. He's just leaned over the wall looking down. 
And what I noticed, first of all, is number one, he had his back to me, which is a huge no-no. If you're in security in that location, you would never just turn your back to people. Mm -mm. Uh, <laughs> second, I noticed he had his military cover on his shoulder and he had a white kippa on his head. And I thought, well, if he's praying, why isn't he inside? Because it's like officially a synagogue in there. Why would he be wearing that kippa out here if he was praying? Why wouldn't he be in there? And why is he turning his back to people? And he just looked at me like this. He never moved his body. He just turned his head and he caught my eye and he went, like, come here, come look at something. He didn't speak to me in Hebrew. He didn't speak to me in English. And I took his picture, so he's real. Uh, <laughs> Because that's what got my eye when I came out. I took a picture of that. Like, this is odd to see a security guy with his back. His back, yeah. To, to the, the traffic. And so I walked over and I looked down to see what he was looking at. And there was a white dove just sitting there. And he still didn't speak. And I took a picture of the dove. I thought, well, maybe that's what he wants. He wants me to take a picture of the dove. And... It didn't click with me at that moment, but the rabbis say that the Garden of Eden, the concealed Garden of Eden is no higher than a height a dove would fly. And so the, that picture of the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon Yeshua, like the heavens open, but it's not like out in the stratosphere, it's right above you. It's just hovering right above you. And so I heard the group I was with come out behind me and I turned around and they're talking about me and they're saying, well, well I looked forward, don't know where she is. And the other one said, well, maybe she's inside. Maybe she's still praying. And another one said something like, yeah, I couldn't see her. And another one said, well, we'll go down into the courtyard and maybe she'll be down in the courtyard. And I'm, I'm like three feet from them, looking straight at them. And I said, guys, I'm right here. They acted like they didn't see me. They didn't hear me. And they kept talking like, well, yeah, maybe I can just text her. And they turn and start to go down the stairs. And I'm standing here like, I'm right here. What are y'all kidding? I thought they were kidding around, just pretending like they couldn't see me. And uh, they start going down the steps. And Rabbi Eitan, who was their guide, he texts me and says, we'll be waiting for you down in the courtyard. And I'm like, how can they not see me? And about that time, that dove flew right over my head. I mean, I could feel it. It was just literally right over my head, and then it flew off. And at that point, one in the group, Tammy, she turned around, and she says, that's the first time I saw you, was when the dove flew over your head. Wow. <laughs> and I just thought it was odd. And then later, I started putting all the things that I knew together that why would I want to go see that? Well, this is like this main statement of faith in the resurrection. I mean, this is the message that changed the world. The, the fact that Yeshua resurrected and therefore we can resurrect too. In Abraham's day, this is the message that changed the world. That there is a resurrection from the dead. And then the Jewish tradition describing how the Garden of Eden is just withdrawn. It's, it's lifted up a little bit into a, a spiritual place that we can't see unless, like Stephen he was able to see into it from where he was. Um, other people have been given glimpses into it. Like remember Elisha, his servant thought the city was surrounded. They were all going to die. And Elisha prays and says, open his eyes. And then they can see the chariots of Israel, the chariots of God in the mountains encircling the city. Yes. But every now and then he gives you a glimpse into another realm and i kind of believe that's what happened to to mary in the garden at the resurrection just because so many strange things are happening and it's like she doesn't know where she is 
The angels know where she is. Yeshua knows where she is. But she doesn't really know exactly where she is, but she's in a garden. Wow. And that's tremendous when you think about it, because wow. the first thing the angels ask her, they say, woman, why are you weeping? And woman in Hebrew is Isha. Isha was Eve's first name. He called her Isha when she was that perfect creation, that perfect reflection of himself. And then after sin, he names her Chava. We say Eve, which is the mother of all living. But her, her perfected state is Isha. And so the, the angels, they say, Isha, why are you weeping? Well, why did the first Isha leave the garden weeping? Wow. Because she had just sinned and fallen into a realm of death. And so if she's returning, if, if Mary, Miriam, is like this Isha who's returning to the garden, then why would you be weeping? You're in a restored place. You're in a place of resurrection, Isha. Don't you know where you are? And then she sees somebody she thinks is the gardener. I mean, you think of first Adam, second Adam, Adam's the original gardener. And he says it too. He says, Isha, why are you weeping? Like, don't you know where you are? Wow. And then it says, Yeshua calls her by name. He says, Miriam. And she turns completely around in the gospel of John. She's talking to a gardener. She turns completely around and she's, starts talking, it says, to Yeshua at that point. And you're like, what in the world's going on here? I mean, what about place? Don't we all have to stay where we are? You know, and it's like there's different rules in this interaction. And he's like, Isha, why are you weeping? And finally he says, Miriam, and she recognizes him. And I think it was one of those moments where she's in that descendant. She thinks she's in a garden where a tomb is, but she's actually been allowed to realize or to experience a place. And it happened all the time in scripture. I mean, people could get moved from one place to the other, like Philip. Right. From the chariot and then completely different location. Yeshua and the disciples, they could be in the middle of the Galilee and then... One second later, they're on shore. And or walking on water. Yeah. And Elijah, when he disappeared, the prophets, the the people around there, they Elisha says, Well, you know, he was taken in the chariot. And they're like, No, we'll go look for him on the mountains. Because apparently back then it was no big deal if the prophets got picked up and put in a different place. So they just accepted it as something normal. Mm. And we think it's like alien talk, <laughs> you know, sci-fi. It's not yeah. sci-fi. White jacket talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But those sorts of things happen there. Mm. Um, I mean, we, we, I could fill a book with things like that, that mm. happened either personally and many times surrounded by people who maybe weren't aware of exactly what was happening but I either knew it or I understood it later and it was just in that's what really provoked me to write 50,000 degrees and cloudy so people could understand the difference between this thing of the rapture that's been handed down to us versus how the bible teaches uh, being gathered into the cloud to, to meet Yeshua in the air and what that really means. Um, but it's in his world, it's completely possible to walk through a crowd and not be seen. You can be right there, but you're not there, but you are there. Mm -hmm. And Israel kind of wakes up your spirit and it gives your, your spiritualized exercise. If, if I could put it that way, um, what you've read in the Bible and what you believe to be true in the Bible, but maybe you've never experienced it before. 
And he wants to give you those experiences in that land. So you'll understand why it is his favorite place in the whole world. <laughs> yeah. So do you think that that's what, when Abraham was at the top of the mountain and he has Isaac bound and then he looks up and sees the ram, do you think that that's kind of what, what that's all, can you talk to me a little bit about that? What do you think that is? A lot of people don't understand that. They, they either skim over it because it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Or they just think, oh, well, he just had, you know, he just was, you know, <laughs> he yeah. was, he was talking metaphorically. Like, <laughs> Well, he's, Yeshua said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. I mean, he saw it. He was allowed to see into, I believe the crucifixion because if, if you, again, if you'll go to Israel, it makes it so real. You'll, you'll understand like physically, sometimes you need to be in the physical place to understand the spiritual message. And it's understood that that event took place on Mount Moriah, which we would call the Temple Mount. Well, the, if you look across the, the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, on the Mount of Olives, uh, there's a, a mikvah, which is a, a ritual bath, an immersion place where they would immerse after they slaughtered and burned the ashes of the red heifer. And the rule was you had to be able to see from that place of the ashes, it had to be a, a direct view to the altar. And you can, if you go to the place where that mikvah is, which had to have been very close to where they, they burned the ashes of the red heifer, because they would have to do the immersion afterward, you can, it's a straight shot over to the Temple Mount. And I'm sure without the structures that are the modern, more modern structures that are there today, you would have been able to see straight across to the altar, which is where Isaac would have been offered and not only that you know we're commanded he says don't make me uh an altar using shaping tools he says i want you to make me an altar of earth and so the altars were built there was an exterior like a shell uh the bronze altar but inside it was earth and the reason for that is understood to be that mankind was created from the earth there where the altar is. And so by Isaac being offered in the very place where mankind was formed, his physical body, where his physical body is formed, it's like returning mankind back for a recreation of sorts. And, and so that's, that's the, the importance of the temple and its location is it's, it's house of prayer for all nations. In other words, it's not just for a particular people group to be special, but it's calling every nation, tribe and tongue to return to the place of their birth, to the place of their creation and by so doing, acknowledging the one who created them and setting aside any other entity, any other idol, anything else to which they might attribute power, saying none of those things have power. Instead, it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so that's the importance of the Temple Mount and its services. And the you know, in some of the traditional sources, it says, if the world understood what they did to themselves by destroying the temple and the altar, they would have never done it. They would have never done it. Mm. Um, and so the, in Yeshua's reign, you know, instituting that third temple, the work that's going to be done there on behalf of the world you know, returning mankind back to that original call to guard the garden and to work the garden, to work and service in Hebrew are the same word, avad, 
And so you, you work in the temple, you serve in the temple, uh, you work in the garden, you serve in the garden. And he hasn't changed the plan. It's not like, well, that was a really bad idea to tell you things to work and serve in the garden. What was I thinking? No, he, he's still right. And it's still his plan. He's just figuring out a way to get us back there in a condition where we can fulfill our purpose. And things can be very good. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. We're having a lot of people that are saying things like that. Hearing you talk about this is opening their eyes to scripture in a new way, being able to experience like the story of Mary at the tomb, not having seen it from that perspective. It's just, it just opens it up. And I, I just trust that the Holy one will make arrangements for all of us to be able to get back to the land soon be there and experience it. You go quite often. And um, I was looking online, I saw a tour that you were involved in. Um, I'm sure that I, I don't have a lot of information on it. But um, Dr. Halisa, you were, you were walking through this beautiful desert area, and you were looking at the different trees, and you were, you were pointing out this and pointing out that and your joy was just so full. And can I just say, <laughs> I want some of that. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll tell you what, I, I am so looking forward to all of us. Wouldn't it be great if all of us could just gather, we could have, we could just have a gathering where all of us were able to get back to the land and be there together and, and experience it together. Yeah. I'm going to trust him for that. So where, where is this, uh, where is this area that you go to um, where you've done some archaeological digging, I believe, and, and you, you go there a lot. Could you explain that to us a little bit? Sure. It's, it's biblical Tamar. It's in the book of Ezekiel and it defines the Southern border. Um, it's the border between Edom um, and Israel itself. And historically, if you look at who controlled the Tamar, it's a fortress. It's a series of fortresses built, you know, each controlling people group would destroy the one before it and then build on top. That's kind of the Middle Eastern thing. And that's why you see things getting higher and higher, uh, especially in Jerusalem. If you've ever been down to the, the lower street levels of Jerusalem, you realize how much higher the modern city is above, like even the Roman Cardo. It's, you look down. And so there it's a fortress that's built, uh, successive fortresses. And that's part of the archeological work is defining which of these walls fits which period. Um, and so we've dug back to um, Iron Age. I know you hear these dogs. <laughs> it's all good. We're enjoying it. We're like in your living room. We're just hanging, having coffee. Yeah, well, they're not Dr. snoring. They could be barking. So <laughs> it's much better. The snoring's much better. <laughs> um, what we were looking for last February was um, Bronze Age material, and particularly interested in getting back to the Mosaic time period or even the Abrahamic time period because there's lots of Romans. I mean, just walking around out there, you'll pick up Roman coins or Roman glass, uh, but they're looking for older things, uh, particularly from Moses' time, but there's also a lot of stuff from King Solomon's time period. He had the fortress there to guard the road between a lot where his ships went out, the copper mines down there in the south, which was vital in Bronze Age, because without copper, you had no tools and you had no weapons. So if you controlled copper, then it, it gave you the, not just economic security, it gave you military security. Um, it was just, that's why they call it the Bronze Age, because that was the thing you had to have. And if you had it, then you had power. And so King Solomon, as far as we know, his rule extended the farthest that it ever did in, in Israel. Uh, and so if you're going to pay your soldiers, if you're going to guard the treasuries from the, the ships going in and out of the port of Eilat, you need a bank 
kind of. Uh, you need a vault. And they have found uh, a stash of coins, not from Solomon's period, from the Roman period, from where they collect taxes. It's the ancient spice route that comes over from Petra and it'll cross there at Tamar. And then it'll go up Scorpion's Ascent where I believe, because they were in the Seen Wilderness, uh, I believe this is where the snakes came out and started biting them because the snakes and the scorpions, they have a kind of a shared equivalency in scripture. And it's, it's called Scorpion's Ascent where the scorpions were allowed to come up and to bite the Israelites when they rebelled. Um, and there's also a, a tradition, an ancient written tradition from the time of King Esar Hadon of Assyria of winged serpents in that area. And they were thought to attack Egypt seasonally, specifically Egypt, they would attack Egypt. Um, but in the case we have, it's they instead attacked Israel because those snakes were called seraphim. And a seraph is a winged serpent. In fact, there's seraph, there's seraph, there's seraphim, seraphim serpents. And so- um, Can you repeat that? So Can you repeat that? We was that was that a fire hose right there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you repeat that real quick. The, the seraphim. Yeah. Seraphim are the fiery serpents, um, fiery beings that are around the throne, the seraphim. Um, and those are specifically the snakes that attack the Israelites in the scene wilderness when Moses had to make the bronze snake to put up on a pole for them to look at. The point of that being is it's not the bronze snake that's going to heal you. It's going to be looking up at the source of your healing. A lot it's, of people it's to miss cause that. You to quit looking down at, right. The natural earth is the reason that you're sinning. You're still attached to Egypt. And that's why you keep rebelling. Uh, like we said yesterday, if you don't let go of the last bar on the monkey bar, you're not going to have enough momentum to swing to the next bar. And they were still hanging on to Egypt and they're just hanging there like dead weight. There's no momentum here. How can he take you forward if you won't turn loose of what's behind? Right. And uh, so much of our complaining and griping and so forth is really, if we're honest, is because we're still clinging to the things we've left behind. Yes. Still putting security and things that are behind us. They, they're not for your security today. In his kingdom, they were for the natural realm. And so they start complaining and then the snakes start biting them. And um, in that particular location right there, that's where the scorpion's ascent is. And the caravans would go over that mountain range. You can still see there's a modern road which I hesitate to call it modern because the guardrail is nothing but 50 gallon oil barrels. <laughs> it's like scary just to even think about, but there's the ancient trail camel trail is still there and you can hike it. They've even cut steps to make it easier on the camels to get through there. And from there they could either, uh, well, they would from there, they would go up to Judea toward Jerusalem, and they could also hang a left and go over toward the Mediterranean to a port city. Um, if they got to that spot, they could also turn left before they crossed the Scorpions Ascent and go to Egypt. So that Tamar right there is really the decision point. And in fact, the story of Tamar, if you'll remember Tamar and Judah, uh, where, she, where she sits, is in a place in that area, but physically it's impossible because we know it's up in the north. And you say, well, why does the Bible place her in a place that is in the extreme south when we know this story is taking place up in the north? And I, th I think it's a, it gets your attention because even though there is no place like that up in the north, there is a place like that, where she's sitting at, um, there's the modern place is called Ain Tamar, and then Tamar is close to that. Uh, but that's, if you read it in Hebrew, it's very specifically a crossroads. 
So the message of the story is Tamar sat at a crossroad for Judah. And Tamar is always going to be a crossroad for Judah. It's a matter of choices. It's an ancient caravan crossroad. But for Judah, it was also a crossroad of decision because the decision he made concerning Tamar and her righteousness, I think is what prepared him to make that decision later to take responsibility for Benjamin yes. and offer his own life in place of Benjamin. Yes. And that it's, it's a place that you either love instantly you're at home I mean, we've seen total strangers go put their stuff up in their caravans. Caravans is kind of like a mobile home, I guess, in English. Uh, They'll go put their stuff up in their rooms and they'll pop back up to the dining hall, just ready to go to work. Like they've been there all their lives. And then other people are very uncomfortable because you're out in the middle of the desert. Uh, You're literally out in the middle of the desert. And so you're cut off and you get to experience exactly what the father did to Israel, what I call the Sally port, the in-between place between Egypt and Israel. He says, I've got to change some things. And it's in this wilderness that it, I'm going to have to do it because he says, I'm going to make you hungry and thirsty to see what's in your heart. Yeah. And you get out there and it's a hunger and thirst that's not physical, really. It's just a discomfort because nothing's assured. If you had a heart attack right there, the closest hospitals may be two hours away over the mountains. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, you're kind of hit it, if you get snake bit or scorpion bit in that area. Um, it's a long way from anywhere. There's the security ask, you're just, a mile or two from Jordan. In fact, your phone might come up and say, welcome to Jordan. Uh, That's how close you are to the mountains of Moab. And uh, it's a unique place. And I think it's exactly what the Bible says it is. It's a crossroad of decision. He wants to show you who you are so you can see what's in your own soul. And you can make a decision there that's going to affect you down the road somewhere in a, in a much more important decision. But if you don't make that decision there, and I think that's why people go there. It's a crossroads. It'll show you what's inside of you. And almost it's like a fitness for duty test. And some people just go back and back until they, they feel like they're fit for duty. But uh, it's, I, of course, I'm a lizard lover, so. <laughs> I love anything lizard-like. I'm not crazy about snakes, but, you know, I'm not terrified of them either. I one uh, stepped on one at Sukkot year before last. I was down there sometimes in the dark um, after supper, after the sun goes down, it's not so hot. And there's an ancient Roman road that goes from Tamar to a gas station out on the highway, and they have great ice cream. And so we'll hike through the desert to the gas station to get ice cream at night. And I was down there around the Roman part of the ruins looking, make sure I was getting the right road for everybody. I didn't want to get everybody over in the mango grove, (laughs) which is adjacent, uh, rather than on the Roman road to the gas station. (laughs) And I got down there and stepped on a snake. And... uh, so they're out there, you know, you, I had on hiking boots and he hit me right at my sock, but he didn't get in. Uh, but it was exciting for a little while. So I was able to get back, you know, into the light and see whether he actually broke the skin. Um, but it, it reminded me, you know, like a Paul, you know, he picks up the serpent and it bites him, but it doesn't hurt him. It's and, and the snakes can represent false doctrine, twisted doctrines. So, so I was about to have been out of shape about it. I'm like, okay, he's telling me I need to be on the alert. There's going to be some twisted story, some twisted doctrine that's going to come at me, and I need to be aware of it. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, with him, we have the power not to be deceived by those things. 
Um, it is a great place. Wow. That's so beautiful. I love, I love what you just said. We have the power in him to not be deceived by those things. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love what you also say. You say it is written and you repeat that a lot, Dr. Halisa. And when you say that it pierces me because our emotions will go one way or another, but when we return our focus to what is written, what he actually said, and in the context of what he said, it, it, it sets, it sets the, it sets the world right again, where we, where our focus is upon him again, and not upon our circumstances, because that's, you know, that's what they do. Circumstances do that. They distract us. That's their job. <laughs> and they do it well. But if we will return, return our eyes back. So, so we have just a few minutes. I promised you that we would, we would release you. Um, we have 13 minutes. We just want to squeeze you and squeeze all of this <laughs> lovely conversation out of you. <laughs> do you need a drink? You need I just, I finished uh, my coffee and then I finished my, <laughs> my green machine or whatever that's called. So Ooh, yes. I must do a green machine by now. <laughs> All right. Good, good um, deal. But you know, that's what the wilderness does for us. He, he says, I want to humble you mm -hmm. because as long as you're in control or as long as you're leaning up on the things of the world for your security, then how can you ever take my hand? That's and good. he's the only one who can take you by the hand and lead you across the Jordan into that place, into that elevated, not just the physical land, but lead you into the garden that hovers just above it. And so he takes you into the wilderness first. He says, I want you to be hungry. I want you to be thirsty. I want to test you to see what's in your heart. And if you can pass that test, the humility test, because see, we all want to talk about what we deserve. I'm an American. I have my rights. Well, maybe you do. But is that who you want to depend? Do you really want to depend on the U.S. Constitution to deliver everything it's promising you? Or do you want to depend upon the Holy One? to deliver upon everything he's promising you. Because I guarantee you one is stronger than the other and able to deliver. Yes. And I, that's where I wanna put my trust in my faith. Yes. And so we might live in the United States or whatever our country is, but we're not of that country. It's merely where he has put us in order to proclaim his word. Uh, up until the time that he gathers us to our true home. And that's what he has to, he has to change your idea of what home is. So instead of looking back, you look forward and say, I, I may have a place where I feel like home, but I know if I've not been to Israel, I have never really felt what home is. And so in order to do that, you have to master the soul, the nefesh in Hebrew. It's, you know, what you think, what you feel, appetite, emotion, desire, intellect, and it will disguise itself as your spirit. And so especially coming out of some backgrounds where people think if they didn't feel anything in church, the spirit wasn't there. Well, maybe that was precisely the point like taking you into the wilderness. He didn't let you feel anything to see if you would still trust that he was there. Just because, you, see, if, if it only depends on how you feel, then it, aren't you God? Because you determine when he's there, when he isn't, instead of allowing him to determine where he is. And he is there. And so... That's why the soul in scripture is always being given instructions by the spirit, like bless the Lord on my soul. It's time to talk now, do something or be silent. Oh, my soul, like shut up. <laughs> Would you just shut up? Shut up you already. Not, yeah. You are not in control here because we are going to, 
to live our lives based on it is written, not I feel, yes. I think. I will. And once your soul yes. begins to trust your spirit, and that's what's happening, your soul is building faith that what your spirit is saying is true. And, and once, you know, you, you build a little bit of faith, like, oh, the word is right. If I'll just do what the word says, then I really won't die. I really won't starve to death. You know what? It, may f it felt like I was dying, but I'm actually still alive. <laughs> and so still it's here. that process that Yeshua had to go into the wilderness, turn these stones into bread. He's like, I'm not hungry for that. It is written. You're supposed to be hungry for the word of God. You know, you want to be in charge of all the kingdoms of the world? Well, who wouldn't? Mm -hmm. But it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God. In fact, in the Hebrew Matthew, it says you shall pray to the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so a prayer is it's like a self-judgment, but it's also an entreaty. And I'm like, which systems of the world are we entreating in order to increase our position, our power, our security, and so forth? And Yeshua says, don't spend too much time entreating the systems, politics, government, military, health systems, all these things that you think provide your security. There's one who provides your needs. And the spirit will tell you that, but the soul will say, yeah, but what about my social security check? <laughs> well, he, he's going to give you your social security check if, if that's the system you're in. But it's not the system you are of. Because I tell you what, it's better to have manna in the wilderness than all the Egyptian bread in the world. Yes. Or all the stimulus checks in the world. Yes, yes. Yes. And it's, and it's right there. That's what, what I'm, I think today, what, what you reminded me of is it's, it's right there. It's just as high as a dove flies. It's not, it's not in outer space. It's not in, it's not, it's not in, it's not out in deep space. It's just, it's just as far as a dove would fly. It brings it, um, Dr. Halisa, it just, it brings it right here, right now. When, when it, when the word says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it doesn't mean that it's off in a far distance or that it's far, far, far away, or it's in some time that you will never reach. It means it's, it's, it's right, it's right here, right now. And that, that breathes hope. Right? That breathes, that breathes um, the possibilities. <gasps> oh, okay. <laughs> I think he, I think that he was putting an exclamation on your. <laughs> yeah, he, he's particularly vocal this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know which would be worse, this or the snoring, which seemed to be getting louder and louder. Oh, no, he is so perfect. I I am so delighted. I'm sure that we have a lot of um, questions. Would you like to take five minutes or would you, do you have something that you would like to just share? We, we have five minutes left with you and then we'll have you back again and, um, and we'll be able to ask you questions too, but. Maybe, you know, if we do this again, mm -hmm. um, there are five things that represent our growth in the Torah. And that's mm -hmm. what I like, especially with new people who mm -hmm. are just kind of getting into this. And there mm -hmm. is going to be every wind of doctrine mm -hmm. because there's a thing called the internet. <laughs> and it's going to be, you know, just a, pretty much what lies ahead of you is a life of separating truth from lies or needful things from not needful things. And that's not necessarily truth and a lie. It's just what is needful and what's not needful, what's going to produce fruit and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And where do I want to spend my time? And so I've got a really simple little 
paradigm that's in scripture about um, the, the substances that are said to flow in the Garden of Eden in the rivers, which is the milk, the honey, uh, the wine, the balsam, and then there's also oil, uh, a discussion of the oil. And it's, it's five liquids, pretty much. And each of those represents a stage of our growth in the word. And I think that can encourage, no matter where you are in your growth stage, it can help you understand that it's okay, you're not going crazy. That it's an age and a stage, and it, it's not your chronological age. It's your spiritual age. And you know that's how the wine factors in. Wine gets better. <laughs> as it ages and um, so maybe if we do this another time and because it's so simple and it's just easy to remember um, and help other people through those stages those age uh, spiritual ages and stages that's really uh, good yeah spiritual but if, ages you know, there's a question ages. what do we got we got a few minutes left yeah we, um, have. we have three three minutes left keeping you on time. I am, I am not going to steal your time today, sister. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. Who had someone had their hand up? Was that Mary? No, it was not me, but I was just commenting in the, in the chat section. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, um, we will have you back if you will, if you will come back and we will, we will go over these five stages of um, ages and stages of growth. That would be fantastic. I would love that. Um, I think it's really important that all of us know that we're right where we need to be right now. If that does not give us the opportunity to flake out, we still have to press in, always pressing in always reaching, always, always running the race, always reaching. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're behind or that you're not where you need to be. You need to just be engaged right where you are right now. And so thank you so much, all of you for being here and for loving on Dr. Halisa. I know that you're all, um, the comments are just beautiful. There's just too many to even go through, but I'm going to save them so you can read them later. <laughs> You can comment on that. Mother's house, there's there's many rooms, you know. Yes. There's, there's many places for us to sit and learn and, and to enjoy that stage of our spiritual lives. So so be comforted in that. Yes, exactly. And I I know that I speak for all of us. We we want to go to the land with you. We really do. We would we would just love to be there with you and experience um for, for some of us, it, it might, we, some of us have been there and then there's many that have not had that opportunity to be there yet. But every time I I've only been once, but every time I can only imagine that it's as if the first time, because the experience would be so new and so fresh and so significant. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to trust that uh, when the borders are open and when things calm down that um the holy one's going to make a way for all of us yeah so thank next you so much jerusalem. yes next year in jerusalem thank you so much and i am uh when we get off here i will be booking you for your next time to come on the show. <laughs> we're going to get our calendars out and make sure because i'm excited about this thank you so much and for all of you that are listening thank you so much for joining us today and and um uh Dr. Halisa, what is your, um, real quick before you leave, what is your uh, beautiful, the beautiful orphanage that you are, that are, you are um, a part of? Could you just give us a real quick, you know, 60 seconds about that? Sure. It's called Lamala uh, mm -hmm. Children's Home, and it's in Kenya. And Lamala in Hebrew means upward. And so uh, it's, we had gone to, teach the creation gospel paradigm to um, the elders of Torah observant congregations all over Kenya. They had collected in Limuru and we did the training there and the testing and so forth so they could in turn teach. 
And we just established a good relationship with them. And then later they approached us about building an orphanage. And sometimes you have true orphans and sometimes you have people who are still orphans because their parents and grandparents are just not there. Uh, physically disabled, whatever, missing, don't nobody knows where they are. Mm -hmm. And so they asked us if we could work with them to build an orphanage. And so we did. And uh, so now I think we've got about 30 kids, Torah observant, they keep the Shabbat, they keep the feast, they keep kosher. And so we just last week, he put money down on a new property that'll give them more gardening room and more room for their milk cow. Um, and get them a little bit farther from Nairobi, which can be challenging. Uh, they just, they wanted a safer place for the kids than where they were. So that's that's the 60 second. That's the 60 second version. And so um, all of you that are here today, uh, part of what your, um, uh, part of what you give to be part of this community, part of that is is helping fund uh, Dr. Alwine's uh, orphanage, just, you know, a small piece of it. Um, and I just say that so that you all know that this is a worthy cause and this is something that is wonderful. And all of the workbooks, if you have, if any of you have um, had a chance to get any of her workbooks, you can get them on Amazon or you can get them uh, through her website, creation, the creation gospel, is it .com? Mm -hmm. I always get confused by thecreationgospel.com. Um, and and that is also for funding the orphanage, which is amazing. And and all of our conferences too, are that a portion of that goes directly to that. So it's really good. So thank you, ladies. Thank you, all of you, for contributing. It's amazing. Um, and uh, Lisa, the question is, is there one, it's better for you is it better for you financially to order off of your website or to order off of Amazon? That's what the ladies are asking right now. We get a greater portion of the royalties directly into the Lamala fund from Amazon, believe it or not. I'm, I'm not crazy about Amazon. I have serious issues with them. <laughs> I, I like to think of it, I'm using them rather than they're using me. Exactly. Uh, but a, a greater portion of the proceeds because they're more efficient. If they order through our website, we're having to do a, a split for them to fulfill the distribution. Okay, so in let's order of off Amazon. Actually, right, how much actually gets to the kids, more of it if you order through Amazon. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. We just want to release you. I know that you have a class you're teaching in a few minutes and I want you to have a, a little bit of a break before you go. But thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for just hanging with the girls. This is, this is amazing. And next time we will do this and we will schedule it. We will schedule it on a time when you have a little bit more time because the best part of this actually is the after party where everybody's mics are unmuted and we just have questions. And, and so next time we will do that with you. We'll make sure that you have, um, uh, we do it during a time that your schedule's free. All right. That's thank wonderful. you so much. Thank you so much and, and we love you. And ladies, I want you to hang in there. We're going to stop the recording, hang in there, don't leave. And we will um, have our, our little after party here. Thank you again, Dr. Halisa, I appreciate you so much. All right, do we want to stop the call?